bringing you true crime from around the world. a link to another horrific crime. This crime was a murder. But first, thank you to all for your best wishes in the last week or so in regards to my marriage to the lovely Kate. So also please be patient if the episodes are a little bit sporadic in the next week or two as we are trying to go on our honeymoon soon. Let's hope the coronavirus doesn't get in the way. But let's get stuck into this case. Research tonight is from thehour.com, Court Records, a bit from Murderpedia, findagrave.com, Killer Women with Piers Morgan, Snapped, and the Journal News. Okay, tonight we go to the state of New York and Connecticut in the US of A, around the turn of the millennium. It's here that husband and wife, Sheila Devalu and Paul Christos, lived in their Pleasantville, New York condo, Sheila, born May 11, 1969, had immigrated from Iran at an early age with her family, sometime in the 70s. She was attractive and quite smart, going to the State University of New York at Stony Brook, where she earned a biochemistry degree. She would go on to marry a family friend, Farid Masavi. She then attended graduate school at New York Medical College in Valhalla, New York, where she completed a master's degree in public health. It's here that she met the handsome and equally smart Paul Christos, born on the 3rd of March 1967. He would graduate and become a medical school teacher. Sheila and Paul would end up dating. Now, I can't say that Paul knew Sheila was married at the time, but my suspicions are that he had no idea. Eventually, Sheila's husband, Fared, found out about the affair and filed for divorce in 1999. Now, culturally and or maybe religiously, divorce was frowned upon by Sheila's family. It brought shame upon them and it was just not the thing to do. But Fared wasn't going to put up with his wife having an affair, so he divorced her. This then led to Paul Christos and Sheila getting married in May 2000. Sheila was working at Purdue Pharmaceuticals at the time on a very high salary. And if you have watched The Pharmacist on Netflix, you know that they are a massive pharmaceutical company. Paul was biostatistician at Cornell Medical College in New York, which with its long commute, the couple didn't have a lot of time to spend together. This did strain the relationship a little. And then one day, Sheila announced to Paul, that her schizophrenic brother, Shaheen, was coming to visit. Now, Sheila told Paul that her brother had no idea she was married and that if he found out that she was married and living with her partner, this would send him off the deep end. So she asked Paul if he could not only leave the home while her brother visited, but if he could take all his stuff with him so as not to leave any trace that a man was living with her as that might set him off. Now, even though Paul had been married to Sheila for a while, he still hadn't met her brother, but had some understanding that he was emotional and easily upset. So Paul obliged and moved his stuff out while Sheila's brother came to visit. Now, to me, look, that's a bit weird. Look, I don't know, maybe Paul was just a really understanding kind of guy, willing to do anything for his wife and her family. Look, I don't know. Anyway, so Paul would end up staying with friends or family while giving his wife time to be with her brother. I suppose he hoped she would break the news to her brother slowly and this would just be a temporary thing. These visits started to get more frequent and then this started to piss Paul off, as you can imagine. Now, we get into some court records here. Now, I will edit them just for flow. Now, throughout this time, Sheila had been gossiping to Paul about this love triangle that was going on at work between her friend Melissa and two other co-workers, Annalisa and a guy named Jack. 
Sheila told Paul intimate details about Melissa and Jack, including that Melissa was upset when Jack rebuffed her sexual advances. Sheila also told him that Melissa had discovered Jack's travel plans and had flown to Jack's destination. She then conveniently ran into him at the airport as he was boarding a plane home and sat next to him on the return flight. Sheila constantly asked Paul for advice on behalf of Melissa with questions such as why Jack was in a relationship with two women and why Jack was cheating on one woman with the other. Paul listened to these stories to, inverted comma, I've got air quotes here, to humour his gossiping wife. Eventually, Sheila told Paul that she wanted to go on a stakeout with Melissa in order to spy on Jack. Although Paul thought the proposed surveillance was a little odd, he didn't think she'd she'd actually do it. He gave her a pair of night vision binoculars. Who's got those lying around? Anyway, Sheila told Paul that she purchased a lockpick set for Melissa because Melissa wanted to break into Annalise's apartment to look at photographs in order to get a sense of the relationship between Jack and Annalisa. Sheila then practiced with the lockpick set on the front door of her Pleasantville condo, and Sheila also asked Paul for a listening device that she knew he owned that Melissa could plan in Jack's office, and they could listen in on his conversations. Now, (laughs) Paul's got night vision goggles and a listening device. I don't know. Look, he's... Probably not going to turn out to be the crazy one at the end of this story. Anyway, early one morning, Sheila telephoned Paul to inform him that she and Melissa were outside Annalisa's apartment and asked him if Melissa should confront Annalisa. Paul told her that Annalisa had a right to know her boyfriend is cheating on her. Now, soon Paul became sick of all this love triangle bullshit gossip and he started to get the shits with Sheila as she was just constantly talking about it. Sheila also told the love triangle story to Amelia Mai and Tammy Mai. They were friends of Sheila and Paul. She told it to Paul's parents and to one or two other friends as well. Sheila told Tammy about Melissa almost every time they spoke and would ask a question such as whether she thought Jack would break up with Annalisa and date Melissa. Sheila told Tammy that Melissa had access to Jack's voicemail and would listen to it on a daily basis to see if he was still seeing Annalisa or any other woman. She also told Tammy that Jack tried to set Melissa up with one of his friends, but that didn't go well because Melissa just wanted to be with Jack. Sheila quite a few times asked Tammy if Melissa should confront Annalisa to let her know that Melissa was also seeing Jack. Tammy advised against this confrontation, but sensed that Sheila wanted her to say that Melissa should confront Annalisa. Now, as part of his work on November the 13th, 2002, Paul had a meeting with representatives from Pharmacia, where Annalisa had worked. The reps mentioned that a colleague of theirs had been recently murdered. Although a name was not mentioned, Paul began to wonder if Melissa did something to Annalisa. Paul mentioned to Sheila that an employee at Pharmacia had been killed and asked whether Melissa was involved and if Annalisa was okay. Sheila seemed not shocked or surprised and responded without elaboration that Annalisa was fine. In late 2002, Sheila told Paul that Jack and Annalisa had broken up and that Melissa and Jack were together exclusively. But also in late 2002, Sheila asked Paul for information about fingerprints and DNA. On December the 8th, 2002, during dinner, Sheila also asked Emilio Mai and Tammy Mai about DNA and fingerprints and questioned whether they have anybody's DNA on file. In early 2003, Tammy noticed that although Sheila continued to talk about Jack and Melissa, She'd not spoken about Annalisa in a while. Tammy asked Sheila about Annalisa and she responded that Jack and Melissa were a happy couple. Annalisa had moved to New Jersey because she had a new job there. I mean, (laughs) this is days of our lives. 
you can see how the afternoon soaps are so popular or they were so popular with some people. Now, all of what I just told you, Sheila's soap opera, well, its relevance will become clear soon enough. But let's get back to Paul and Sheila's relationship. Paul still loved Sheila dearly, even though there was this issue with having to constantly be away from the house because of Sheila's brother. And this is where we get to the night of March 23, 2003. Sheila asked Paul if he wanted to play a little game where one would be handcuffed and blindfolded, then the other would touch them with objects they found around the house and they'd have to work out what they were. Paul thought this was a good chance to have a bit of fun to try and spend some quality time with his wife and hopefully repair their strange ma- strange marriage. Strange, it is strange. Sheila volunteered to be the first to be handcuffed and blindfolded with Paul touching her with multiple items while Sheila guessed what they were. Then it was Paul's turn. He lay on the floor, blindfolded and handcuffed to a chair. Well, I don't know if it was the first object that Paul had to guess, but he soon felt a heavy weight on his chest while Sheila was straddling him and stabbing him with a knife. In the confusion and the pain, Paul screamed. Sheila said it was an accident and then Paul felt a second sharp pain to his chest as Sheila stabbed him again. Paul then screamed for her to uncuff him, but she told him she couldn't find the keys. Sheila took his blindfold off and Paul could see blood pouring down his shirt. He again screamed for her to get the keys and uncuff him and then to call 911. Sheila grabbed her phone, went out of the room And when she returned, she told Paul that an ambulance was on its way. 30 minutes later, when no one had turned up, Paul begged her to call again. Sheila told him that they said they were busy and would attend when they could. Paul then asked if she could drive him to hospital instead, but Sheila had a better idea. She would go to the local clinic and get a doctor from there. Paul was now losing a lot of blood and getting weaker. He was still handcuffed. Sheila walked out of the house and returned just five minutes later, telling Paul the clinic was closed. Paul then insisted that she take him to the emergency room at the hospital. Sheila then miraculously found the keys to the handcuffs, unlocks them and puts Paul in the back seat of their car and drives off to Westchester Medical Centre. Now, rather than stop out the front of the emergency entrance, she drives past that and goes around the back to the car park. She then opens the back door. Now, Paul at this stage is very weak and has lost a lot more blood. Now, instead of helping Paul out of the car and into the hospital, she reaches into the back seat and she stabs him a third time. This time, she stabs him in the heart. Paul screams, she's trying to kill me. Several, he screams this several times and is able to get out of the car. Now, bystanders hear this and race over to help him. Paul's able to snatch the knife off Sheila and throws it aside where it falls between a pile of rocks and Sheila's unable to get it. Sheila then jumps back into the car and drives off as the Good Samaritans call 911 for help. Before police and ambulance get there, Sheila returns, gets out of her car in a panic and tries to get Paul back into the rear seat. The bystanders are able to fend her off and police turn up and they end up arresting her. Paul is taken into the emergency room while Sheila is taken downtown. She is sure he will die. Now, while in the interview room, Sheila tries to make out that Paul had come home with the stab wounds and that she had no idea how she got them. Police interviews didn't let on that Paul had survived and had already told them that Sheila had stabbed him twice in the condo, then once again at the car park. He told them everything before he went into surgery. Now, they let her think that he was probably not going to make it. And then they dropped the bombshell on her that he'd told them everything. Sheila then struggles to make up a new story, then tells police that they were just playing a game and then at one stage, Paul sat up and that's how he got stabbed. Then in shock, he ended up sitting up again, causing the second stab wound And then the resulting struggle, he managed to get stabbed a third time. She then told them that she called 911, but after no one came, she decided to drive him to the emergency room herself. 
In fact, during the interview, Sheila was more worried about her dogs at home being unattended than the condition of her husband. Now, this is always a dead giveaway, I'm sure all you true crime people know. So the cops have her phone and they check her call records and they find that no 911 call was made. They formally arrest her and charge her with aggravated assault. Paul survived the attack. Luckily, the third stab wound only nicked his heart and he would eventually make a full recovery. But that's the only to start of this twisted tale. When police interviewed Paul after his operation, he told them that his marriage had become strained of late, especially after Sheila's brother had been visiting recently. He told them that her brother was mentally ill, didn't know that she was married, and that he had to leave and take all his stuff with him and hide the rest every time he stayed over. Paul told them that this was so the brother wouldn't go crazy. Now, I can imagine the police on hearing this, they're probably looking at each other with that, uh, yeah, right, look. On checking of phone records, they saw that there was one call made at the time of the initial attack. It wasn't the 911, as Sheila had told them. It was to a contact in her phone named Nelson. Now, on a hunch, they called Sheila's workplace, Purdue Pharmaceuticals, and casually asked the receptionist, that they'd just been speaking to a Nelson guy and they were trying to contact him over a business deal. They were able to get this Nelson's last name, Nelson Sessler. Well, I I suppose the cops thought if she was having an affair, it would probably be a co-worker. Now, that's just a good little bit of police work there. So instead of calling 911 after the initial stabbing, she's called this Nelson guy. They brought him in, and this is where things really get freaky. Nelson doesn't live in the state of New York. He lives in Connecticut, and so the cops organised for him to be interviewed at Stanford Cop Shop. He told them he'd been dating Sheila on and off for about a year, and when they told him that she'd just been arrested for stabbing her husband, Nelson was shocked. He had no idea she was married. He went on to say he had started dating her in early 2002 and had broken it off a few months later as he'd found a new workspace, workplace lover, Lisa Ann Ramundo. Now, does that name ring a bell? So let's go back in time to 2000 and talk a bit about this Nelson Sesler and Anna Lisa Ramundo. As I said before, Sheila and Nelson worked together at Purdue Pharmaceuticals and started a relationship. Annalisa Raimondo also worked there at the time. Now, Annalisa was born September 11, 1970. Her parents were both talented doctors. She was a gifted student, earned an undergraduate degree from Harvard University and went to Columbia University for a master's degree. In late 2000, Nelson met Annalisa at an after-work happy hour and in the summer of 2001, Nelson met Sheila for the first time at another after-work happy hour. That's <laughs> happy hour at Purdue. Sheila told Nelson that she was divorced, although she was still married to Paul Christos. Nelson began separate sexual relationships with both Sheila and Anna Lisa. In 2002, Nelson broke off his relationship with Sheila and started dating Anna Lisa Raimondo exclusively. Now, Sheila didn't take the breakup that well at all, especially with Nelson dating Annalisa. Annalisa then left Purdue to go and work at Pharmacia, and soon her and Nelson would get engaged. Nelson still had his own place in Stanford, but spent most of his time at Annalisa's place at 123 Harbour Drive, apartment 105, also in Stanford. Now, I will read from court records here, and again, I do edit this just for flow. A few minutes after noon on November 8, 2002, the Stanford Police Department received a 911 call in which the caller reported that a man was assaulting someone at this 123 Harborview Apartment 105. The caller claimed to be a neighbour. Now, part of the call goes as follows. I think a guy has attacked my neighbour. I saw a guy go into her apartment. When asked what the name of her neighbour was, the caller said, I don't know her name, but the guy was there and attacked her. I heard yelling. I heard yelling. The dispatcher knew that Harborview was a commercial area without apartments and knew the given address had to be incorrect. After the caller hung up, 
The dispatcher called back that number and discovered that the call had come from a payphone at a Duchess restaurant on Shippen Avenue in Stamford. The dispatcher telephoned the Duchess restaurant and spoke to the manager, who had not noticed anyone at the payphone. The dispatcher sent officers to 123 Harbour Drive, apartment 105, which she knew was a residential facility near the Duchess restaurant. An officer knocked on the door of apartment 105 and received no answer. He pushed the door open and saw the deceased victim, Anna Lisa Raimundo, on the floor of the front foyer. The officers saw no sign of forced entry, burglary or ransacking. Annalisa had died from multiple stab wounds and a cranial injury. The crime scene indicated a violent struggle had gone on for quite a while as furniture was overturned, plants knocked over and blood was everywhere. The place was a mess. Forensic examiners would find blood on a sink handle in the bathroom. This was taken for DNA analysis. The blood looked like it had attempted to be cleaned up after the murder maybe to clean the weapon or the attacker clean themselves. It could be assumed that this blood was fresh because of the way Annalisa kept things clean and the sink was non-porous. Any old blood would have been washed away. It was obvious that Annalisa had put up a fight. She was small but extremely fit. On the ground amongst the bloodstains was a dumbbell, although police were not sure if it had been used as a weapon at this stage. The knife used by the assailant was not found. One of the detectives investigating the murder described it as a violent, brutal rage. When Nelson returned after work to Annalisa's apartment, police officers questioned him. Now, Nelson gave officers the name of two other women he dated who suffered from mental illnesses. He did not, at that time, tell police about his overlapping sexual relationship with Annalisa and Sheila. After several hours of questioning, the police released him. The police were unaware at this point of any connection between Sheila and the crime. Another thing of note is that when Nelson did arrive at the apartment, he went off and sat by himself in a boat shed. Now, this was after he'd found out Annalisa had been murdered. Nelson would now be a prime suspect, as those, (coughs) always those that are close to the victim usually are. The state medical examiner performed an autopsy and ruled multiple stab wounds to the upper body and blunt force trauma to the head as the cause of death. Nelson at this stage, as I said, he's a prime suspect. With that comes the inevitable shunning by friends and colleagues. Look, this it is human nature. He would have had his face plastered all over the news. People do jump to conclusions. Even if you're innocent, mud sticks. But there was this one friend he could count on. That was Sheila Devalu. She sent him a care package, consoled him, and was one of the few people willing to talk to him about Annalisa at that time when most people found it a little bit awkward. In January 2003, Sheila invited Nelson to go on a group ski trip. Now, this group turned out to be only her and Nelson. He again started shagging Sheila, and she would invite him to her condo, but again, only after having first told hubby Paul that her mentally ill brother was visiting. Now, I don't know if anyone's spidey sentence is starting to get a tingle. So, the trail goes cold on the murder of Annalisa. Nelson is cleared of any involvement as he has a rock-solid alibi. Now, we're back to the stabbing of Paul Christo in March 2003. So, he's been stabbed several times by Sheila, twice in the house. He asked her to call 911, and after (laughs) no first responders turn up, he pleads with her to take him to hospital. She does, but then drives past the emergency room entrance to a car park where he gets out of the car, then she stabs him again. She drives off, then comes back to try to get him back in the car, but bystanders restrain her, and police show up and arrest her. When police go to Paul and Sheila's condo to do initial investigations, who do you think shows up but Nelson Sessler? He finds police officers searching the residence. They inform him that there'd been a domestic dispute and that Paul Christos was in hospital. It didn't click straight away that Paul Christos was Sheila's husband as he had no idea she was married. 
Later, after reading an article in a newspaper about the stabbing, Nelson contacted the Stanford police and informed them that they should consider Sheila to be a suspect in the death of Annalisa. Eventually, Nelson told officers about his concurrent affairs with Sheila and Annalisa. He tells police that Sheila had called him to come over that night. When they check Sheila's call records, they find out that after she stabbed Paul in the condo, the phone call she made at that time was not to 911, but to Nelson, inviting him over for a date to get there at around 8.30pm. I mean, (laughs) what the fuck? So it's not long before investigators start to wonder if there's a love triangle going on here. February the 4th, 2004, Sheila is charged with assault, criminal possession of a weapon and attempted murder. Sheila then goes to trial. The prosecution said that Sheila's motive was to kill her husband to avoid the shame that a second divorce would bring upon her and her family. Her defence said that it was all just an accident during a sex game and that she was depressed at the time and didn't know what she was doing. Her phone records showed that she had called her lover Nelson rather than 911. Her initial story that Paul came home already stabbed and bleeding, that may have worked if Paul had died, but he was able to tell his side of the story. Now, Paul, he testified that he still loved Sheila and wanted her to get help rather than go to prison. I mean, he seems like such a nice guy, doesn't he? February 19th, the judge found Sheila guilty. By the way, it was a judge-only trial without a jury. Sheila Devalu was found guilty of attempted murder. She got 25 years without parole. Now, Paul did divorce Sheila after this conviction. Now, while all this was going on, police and investigators still had Sheila as their prime suspect in the murder of Annalisa. As she was locked up, they had plenty of time to gather evidence and go after her. They found that Sheila's DNA was found at the scene. It was on the handle in the sink in the bathroom where they found that blood. Now, often when a knife is used in an attack, the attacker will also get cut and bleed. If there was a struggle, then this blood can end up splattered everywhere and anywhere. And in this case, Sheila's DNA profile from blood samples taken from the sink matched. Now, as Anna Marie was a fastidious cleaner, the blood sample taken at that sink had to be reasonably fresh. Sheila had cut a thumb that day also, as witnessed by her husband Paul. But she said it was from opening a can of dog food. Sheila was absent from work at the time of the murder as well. She had gone into work, but it had left later that morning, giving her plenty of time to drive to Annalise's apartment and commit the crime. Sheila told police she had gone home, as she often did, and that's where she could work. This was backed up by her husband, as he said she'd often go home early from work and take a walk. Sheila, however, was unable to provide witnesses to her being at home or walking near the home at the time of Annalisa's murder. Sheila was charged with the murder of Annalisa and she decided to defend herself. Now, this is a typical narcissistic thing to do, thinking that she could defend herself better than a lawyer. Actually, what I reckon is she thought she could react on the fly to any evidence or testimony against her by defending herself, rather than have to rely on a lawyer that she's probably had to tell a bunch of lies to. Now, other than the DNA, most of the evidence was circumstantial. The jury heard that the love triangle story that Sheila would tell her husband and friends about Melissa, Jack and Annalisa, which made more sense now that Sheila was actually describing herself as Melissa, Nelson was Jack, and Annalisa, well, was Annalisa. Now, after Annalisa was murdered, when she'd be telling her friends this gossipy love triangle story from work, Sheila started talking about DNA and fingerprints. The jury heard the 911 call at the start of the trial. Now, because Sheila defended herself, she spoke at length during her trial. Now, when the jury heard that 911 call later during deliberations, they realised the voice on that 911 call was none other than Sheila Davalu herself. <laughs> In 2012, 
she would be found guilty of the murder of Annalisa and get 50 years to be served after she completes the 25 years she got for the attempted murder of her husband. A total of 75 years. Now, Piers Morgan recently did an interview with Sheila. She still can't take responsibility and maintains she's innocent. Well, mainly innocent. She says she wasn't at the murder scene and that the prosecutors got it wrong. Sheila says she was shopping at the time and she has call records to prove it. Now, how her DNA got in the sink, she can't explain. It's currently on Netflix, this Piers Morgan show, in a series called Killer Women. Check it out. It has some of her police interviews as well, where she comes up with some of the, this real bullshit. But you can make, make up your own mind on that. Well, Islanders, Sheila thought she was really smarter than those detectives. Now, where she slipped up and got caught in the attempted murder of her husband was that he didn't die and was able to tell his side of the story. So the initial stabbing could have been seen as accidental or happened before he got home, but the second stabbing in the car park of the hospital sealed her fate. With the murder of Annalisa, she left her DNA at the scene and made a 911 call after the attack, which voice analysis also would prove to be her voice other than the fact that she defended herself, so she was heard throughout her trial, and the juries just went, oh my God, that's her on the 911 call. The bit I, I find absolutely amazing is how Paul, her poor husband, believed that her brother was coming over to stay. He had to move all his stuff out. I mean, those coppers, when they found out that story, really were looking at each other like, is this guy gullible? I mean... That's a horrible word, gullible, because he seemed like such a nice guy. To call him gullible, yeah, but, you know, he was just trying to do the right thing to try and patch up his marriage. The sad part of all this, though, is that Anna Lisa was a totally innocent party to all this cheating and bullshit that went on. And she paid for it with her life. Nelson, I wonder if it made him think twice about being the office stud, if that's the right word to use. At least Sheila won't be getting out of prison in a hurry. So now we get to the end of the show. Patreon, a big shout out to all the past, present patrons of the island. As you know, True Crime Island is a totally listener supported show. So you won't hear ads, just occasional promos for podcasts I think you might check out. To become a patron, go to patreon.com forward slash true crime island. And if it's for as little as a dollar a month, you too can help support the island. Look, I'm still waiting for a couple of email replies for a reward. So if you have qualified, please check your email and get back to me. If you'd like to buy me a beer via PayPal, then go to donate.truecrimeisland.com. Cheers. Cheers, beers. I have merch, truecrimeisland.threadless.com. I will be changing that shop soon. Also, you can support the show by rating and reviewing. Also, by sharing it with your friends and family. Use the hashtag BoomFuckerLunder in your social media. All the links include, include <laughs> for the social media are on my website, truecrimeisland.com. Okay, so that's about it. I've been your host, Cambo. You've been listening to True Crime Island. And as I always say, don't forget to delete your browser history. Good night and BoomFuckerLunder. <laughs>